<clears throat> Thank you very much, Gary. I really appreciate so much uh, the privilege of coming and speaking to you about the work that we're doing in India. Uh, I'm prejudiced, I'll say that right up front, but I don't believe there's a greater work going on anywhere in the world tonight than what's going on in India. Now, don't misunderstand that. The gospel needs to go everywhere. It doesn't matter whether it's being received everywhere or not. The gospel still needs to go everywhere. But India is white under harvest and has been for the last 20 years or more. Uh, the results in India are incredible. The receptiveness of the people in India is incredible. And so I believe it's one of the greatest evangelistic works going on anywhere in the world today. We have a team of five full-time American workers, and then we have literally thousands of Indian workers, preachers, that work with us uh, in India. It's, it really is a very, very big work. Uh, it's an Indian work. Uh, we help them financially a lot, but we've stressed to them that this has to be their work, and it has to be set up to where if and when we're not allowed to go anymore or we can no longer fund the work, the work will continue on. A couple of unique things that we do. We don't support local preachers in India. We have thousands of preachers that work with us. We financially support less than 100. Probably more around 60 or 65 or 70 are actually supported on a regular basis by us. We call them team leaders. They're translators. They do almost exclusively campaign work and those kind of things they teach in our schools. But we stress that local preachers need to be supported by local congregations. And we don't want local preachers to become dependent on American money. And so we encourage local churches to support their own preachers. Um, India is a country of 1.3 billion people. One third the size of the United States with a population of three to four times that of the United States. So a lot of people in this great country. What makes India unique over almost any other mission work going on in the world tonight is the fact that Indian people are among the most religious people in all the world. You don't have to talk to Indian people about the need to be religious. They're deeply religious people. Now, a lot of it's idolatrous, but you don't have to talk to them about the need to believe in a supreme being. In America, sometimes, before you can get around to talking to them about what you have to do to become a Christian, you've got to convince them that they need to even believe in God or believe in the Bible or things of that nature. Indian people are deeply religious people, and so that gives us uh, a common ground that we can deal with these wonderful people. I want to introduce you just quickly uh, to the team. This way. Okay, neither one seems to be. Okay. I need to back up. This is Ron and Karen Clayton. Ron started this work back in 1979, and I'm not exaggerating, literally gave his life, wore himself out over the next 42, 43 years in India would spend a great deal of the year in India. We're limited. We can only stay six months at the most, and then we have to leave. You have to be gone one day, and then you can come back in, but you have to leave the country for at least one day. Ron would spend several months a year, he and Karen, in India every year, and when he wasn't there, he was here reporting and fundraising. Ron died unexpectedly in the spring of 2021, and that's kind of how I got involved with the work. Uh, I went to his funeral. Ron became a very, very dear friend of mine, and when I went to his funeral, uh, there were still, at that time, three full-time team members. Because I'd been involved with the work on a part-time basis for so many years, they said, please consider coming on board full-time. You know the work. You've done some fundraising. Uh, we need you on board full-time. And so I made the decision in August of 2021 to go full-time with the work in India. This is Ron's son, Kyle. Over 25 years ago, on one of the mission trips with his father, he met Sony, married Sony, and they lived in India for the next 25 years. Even though he was married to an Indian, he still had to leave. He wasn't a citizen, so once every, every six months, they had to leave the country for at least a day. 
So they would take little trips to neighboring countries, just take a little getaway and then come back in. But they spent literally 25 years in India. So he knows the law, he knows the culture, uh, just so many things that are so important to doing uh, foreign mission work. This is Brother Robert Hall and his wife Faye. Robert is the new director of the team, has been involved several times with the work over the years, does a great job, uh, been a gospel preacher for many, many years. This work is under the oversight of the elders at the Shiloh Church of Christ in Hazel Green, Alabama. And when Ron passed away, they immediately reached out to Robert to take over Ron's position. This is Brother Ben Reniger, who's been with the team for many years. Ben does something that uh, is very important in the work. Ben, on a regular basis when he's in India, conducts denominational preacher seminars. We'll gather together uh, denominational preachers and spend several days talking to them, teaching them about New Testament Christianity. It's been very successful. I'll talk more about that in a moment. This is another new team member, Joe and Diane Evans uh, from Arkansas. Joe's been involved in the work in India for a long time, but not with this team. Decided right about the time I did to come on board full time. Joe conducts uh, leadership training. He began by just bringing preachers together and teaching them how to have elders and things of that nature, elders and deacons. But now he's training preachers that go back and actually work with congregations to help them establish elderships. And he's, as a result of his efforts, over 300 congregations have appointed elders since he began this, this uh, special ministry. And this is me and my wife, Diane. We have two Dianes, uh, one with one N and one with two. So we have Diane 1 and Diane 2. Uh, so we have two Dianes, and that's how we keep them separated. Again, I've been involved in this work part-time since 1990. I took a nine-year hiatus uh, due to changes in my circumstances that didn't allow me to go. And so when I went back this year in February and March, I had not been there in over nine years, and it was exciting to get to go back. Uh, I would promised Brother Ron Clayton I was going to come back on board uh, in 2021. Unfortunately, Ron passed away a few months before I was able to do that. <clears throat> India has 15 or 16 official languages. English is one of them. If you stay in a major city like Bombay, which is now Mumbai, or Hyderabad, or Bangalore, or Madras, a major city, you could probably go into most stores, most hotels, restaurants, and someone there will speak English well enough to take care of you. We do most of our work, a lot of our work, outside of the city, and for that we most, almost always have to use a translator. So they have 14 or 15 official languages. Off of those, they have hundreds of little dialects. And so when you have a translator, you not only have to be sure you have a translator, you've got to be sure you've got the right one. I've actually shown up in places to, to preach, and my translator gets to talking to the audience and come to me and say, Brother, I'm sorry, I can communicate a little with these folks, but I don't know the language well enough to translate for you. And we just have to turn it over to some local Indian preacher and say, you're going to have to conduct this meeting because I, I can't talk to them. You'll appreciate this, Gary. I've shown up at places where there are three different languages in the audience, so I have three translators. So I speak, then the translator speaks, then another translator speaks, and another translator speaks. Time it gets back to me, I forgot what I said in the first place. <laughs> it gets interesting trying to keep up with it. But uh, I enjoy working with a translator, we, and if you get a good one, it works well. One of the things you're going to immediately recognize, and, and the purpose of the presentation tonight is to give you a feel for the culture as well as the work itself. And so I'm going to show you a lot of slides just about India. But one of the things you're going to immediately be impressed with is how many people there are. This is just a typical daily scene. This isn't something where like a football game just let out and you've got all these people walking around in the street. This is just every day in India. The little yellow vehicles you're seeing are what they call auto rickshaws. That's their version of a taxi cab. It's just a little motorcycle, 50 to 100 cc motorcycle engine, a bench seat in the back that will comfortably seat two adults. I've seen them go by with water buffalo, adult water buffaloes in the back of those things. Probably taking them to a vet somewhere to get them taken care of. You'd be amazed at how many people they can put in one of those things. Uh, they're horrible to ride in, but they're inexpensive if you need to get around town. This is a <laughs> There's not really 20 lanes of traffic there. That's just everybody lined up because they want to be the first to go when it's their turn. 
And if you can imagine the other side of the street, everybody lined up trying to come the other way, the same way, then you know what happens when everybody starts moving. You've got a humongous traffic jam. But that's pretty typical. This was a street that I was supposed to drive down on a Friday night to speak. We got there. Vendors had set up in the street to sell their goods. So we had to park the car a good way away and walk in. What made this even more interesting was my meeting that night was on the roof of a house out in the open. No speaker. So I'm speaking and the people on the street are bargaining and they're haggling and they're arguing over prices and things like that. So it was an interesting uh, meeting to say the least. This is not a traffic jam. This is just traffic. In a city in India, this is the kind of thing you're going to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So it gets to be pretty interesting at times. This is the team. We did something that we had not done in 40 years on this team. Because of Brother Ron Clayton's death, there was a lot of anxiety. Because of COVID, nobody had been there in two years to begin with. The Indian government took all of our visas away. And then on top of that, Brother Ron Clayton dies, the director of this team, for 40-plus years. So the Indian brethren were very anxious as to what was the future of the work. Were the Americans going to continue to be involved? Were we going to continue to help with the work? And so because of that, we made the decision for all five of the full-time team members to go at once to India and have a meeting with a hundred of our key India team leaders to assure them that the work was going to continue. You see, our goal is not for us to be there at the same time. Our goal is for one of us to be there all the time. And so we take turns. We go for several weeks, then another one will come and stay for several weeks, and we just rotate in and out during the year. So we have one of us there almost all the time. But we felt it was important for them to meet the new team, to meet the new team leader, and to talk about the future of the work. So we had a two-day meeting uh, with 100 of our Indian team leaders to talk about the future of the work. This was an actual picture of all the Indians that were there, the Americans sitting there in front. Not only did we took turns over those two days, all five of us took turns speaking, and then we broke up three or four times into groups of 20. Each, all five of us would take 20 Indians, and we would have small group meetings like this and let them talk to us about uh, the work, what their fears were, what their concerns were, what we needed to do to make the work better. Uh, their response was, please don't wait 40 years to do this again. They said this has been so important for the work. This is Brother Robert Hall speaking to the gathering of our Indian team leaders. Brother Joe Evans found a, a ready reference book in English, one of these things that just has a Bible topic and then a whole bunch of verses that relate to that Bible topic. Had it translated into Telugu, I think printed 3,000 copies. Because we had our team leaders there, we gave each of them a copy and then gave them 10, 15, 20 copies to take back to the preachers that work under them. And so we distributed a whole bunch of them right there on that one occasion. But it was extremely well done, hardback, uh, hardback covering, and very inexpensive. And the Indian brethren absolutely loved that little book, that little tool. We have a school in India for poor children. Um, one of the problems with getting a real good public education is they want you to make a donation to the headmaster. Now, they call it a donation to the headmaster. It's basically a bribe to the headmaster to get your child in school. Poor families can't afford it. And so we started a school. It's overseen by a wonderful Christian family uh, in India. Started a school for poor Indian children. If they have any means at all to pay, they do pay some. Not nearly what they'd have to pay to go to a an uh, open public school, and then we helped them financially as well to keep this school going. I'd been there many times when they knew I was coming, and so the children would have songs to sing for me, and there'd be a program. I showed up this time unannounced. I did that on purpose. I wanted to see how the school's operating when they don't know I'm coming, and so I just walked in unannounced, and I was thrilled. Every class was meeting. The teachers were doing their job. The children were learning. Uh, prior to COVID, they had over 200 students from kindergarten through the 10th grade. High school stops in the 10th grade in India, and then they go on to further if they want to. Uh, after COVID, we have about 125, 130, because some parents haven't allowed their children to come back yet. But every class was there. They were meeting. They were studying. And it was just exciting to be there. These next pictures are just some of the classes that I visited. One of the cultural things you deal with in India 
is that on the first anniversary of the death of a family member, they have some kind of a memorial. Well, while we were there, it was the first anniversary of Brother Ron Clayton's death. And the Indians were pretty well adamant that we have some kind of memorial in his honor. We knew this was going to be a big deal. And so we rented this hall. We didn't decorate it. It was just like this when we rented it. But look at this next picture. 800 people or more showed up at this memorial for Brother Ron Clayton. Not just Christians. There were Muslims there. There were store owners there. People he had interacted with for 40 years came out to pay their respects and, and share their memories of Brother Ron Clayton. One of the fun things in India is even if you're speaking to Indians who speak English, you have to be very, very careful what you say. When this was over, Ron's son got up. We had eight or ten big pictures of Ron displayed. And Ron's son got up and said, if anyone would like to take a picture of my father, feel free to do so. Now, what he meant by that is, if you'd like to take a picture of one of the pictures, you can. He said, though, if you would like to take a picture, feel free. You know what they did? They took the pictures. Literally took the pictures. When I left, they got all of them back but one. <laughs> they, found out, they found out where they had gone because they were very special pictures. But they under, you know, that's what he said. At the big meeting with the uh, India team leaders, we told them, we're going to reimburse. You have to sign in when you get here. And if you sign in, we'll reimburse your travel. We knew some would have to come by bus. Some would have to come by train. But we said we'd reimburse your travel. That's all we said. One brother rented a really nice car and a private driver, <laughs> and he showed up. Well, we'd promised we'll reimburse your travel expense, so we did. But we sent him home with a carload of Indian preachers to drop off on the way back <clears throat> to save them that expense going home. But you have to be careful. Even if you're speaking English, you have to be careful. This is a, uh, you know the wraparound garment that Indian women wear, it's a one-piece wraparound garment, it's called a sari. This is a little private shop where ladies make saris. And uh, I talked to the only lady that was there when I was there. I just happened to be walking down the street and saw this. But she said it takes her three to four days to make one. She'll sell it for 15 to $20. And then the store owner, I'm sure, jacks the price up three or four times and sells it to the public. You can't really see it here, but she has to be down at that lowest level to work that loom or whatever it is they call that machine where she makes the sari. So she has a pad where she sits. When she gets tired of sitting, if she needs to stand up, of course, she has to be at that same level. They dig a hole at the base. And so when she stands up, she steps down into a hole and she steps, stands down in that hole while she's working that loom. So they spend a lot of hours there, and that's the way they continue to stay at the same level. But she's trying to make a living for her family. A lot of people in India are extremely poor. That's a village scene taken several years ago, but not much has changed out in the villages. But I want you to look at this next slide. 325 million live on $650 a year. That's a family of four. Another 300 million live on $1,500 or less a year. You put those two together, that's half the population of India is living on $1,500 or less a year, not a month, a year. And so there's a lot of poverty in India. But what's fascinating about these wonderful people is despite their poverty, they're some of the most hospitable people you'll ever meet in all your life. We do a lot of what they call gospel meetings, I'll talk about that more in a moment, in people's homes. And they may expect 15 to 20 people show up, and 50 may show up. That's how open these people are to coming. Well, they always feel obligated to serve refreshments, not because we want them to. They just want to. And a lot of times, they don't have near enough. And so I'll see them huddled over there talking, and I'll say, what's the problem? Brother, we don't have near enough refreshments. Well, is there a store close by? Yes, we'll go get what you need. How much is it going to cost? And they'll tell me, it'll be $5, $10, but they don't have $5. They don't have $10. They probably didn't have the money to pay for it in the first place. But it's important to them to be hospitable. Uh, if I go into an Indian home to eat, they're probably going to feed me far better than they eat themselves most of the time. 
one of our drivers who has a, is a salaried employee of ours, so he's making decent money by India standards. I asked him on this trip, I said, brother, how often does your family eat meat? He said, Sundays only, Sundays only. So the rest of the time they're living on rice and things of that nature. If we go into an Indian home, they're going to serve us meat. I had a translator tell me one time that what this family spent to feed me and a couple other guys with me probably was a month of their food allowance. I almost always leave a little gift for the family. I don't tell them it's for the meal. I just leave a little gift and say, this is for your family. I love your family. Appreciate your kindness and your hospitality. Use this any way you need, hoping that it'll recoup their food allowance. But they feel the need to be hospitable. They always greet you everywhere you go. This is very standard greeting. They put a garland around you. I want you to look at this next one, though. I'd been there 23 or 24 times. I'd never in my life seen a garland that big. I don't know what that thing weighed. They wouldn't put it around my neck. They just held it there. Uh, I have no idea what it weighed. Now, I want you to watch this next one. This will show you how important a person I really am. <laughs> Now, do I not look like royalty there? <laughs> I'm really not that important, folks. I don't think I am, and I'm really not. But there's three different greetings there. They will greet you sometimes by giving you a hat. They always greet you with the garlands, but then they also wrap a shawl around you. And so I got all three greetings, and part of that was because they'd not seen me in nine years. And they were absolutely thrilled that I was back. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I mean that in a very humble way. Uh, because it's quite an experience to, ex to experience the love that these brethren have for those who come and help. I want to tell you a real quick story. My wife and I had a son who was a gospel preacher, did mission work with me in India, and unfortunately we lost him um, nine years ago. I had not been back to India since he passed. At least three or four times on this trip, I'd show up at a place and one of the preachers would come and stop and start crying. And he'd say, brother, I'm so sorry about your son. And brother, we didn't think we'd ever see you again. We've been texting you for nine years, brother, and you would just say, I don't know if I'll ever be able to come back to India or not. And brother, you're back. And it was just heartwarming to, to see that kind of love from your brethren that far away. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. One of the things that has improved between the major cities, we do a lot of work again outside the city, but between the major cities, the road system has really improved. So trips that used to take us eight to 10 hours, we can now do sometimes in four or five. And because of that, these little travel plazas have opened up. You can get a decent meal there, clean restrooms, some little shops where you can buy knickknacks. But I want you to look at this next sign explaining where the bathrooms are. Look at this carefully. Men to the right, men to the left, I'm sorry, because women are always right. <laughs> now, I'll leave that up to you all to debate after I'm gone. But now that's what the sign says, men to the left, because women are always right. This is a pretty typical Indian meal. Rice, a real spicy curry sauce, and a little chicken, real common meal. This is also very typical when you're trying to drive somewhere. You just have to stop in the middle of the road because somebody's driving their cattle, sheep, goats, and different things to different locations, and you just have to stop and wait till they get by. This is not anything special. It's not a carnival. It's not a parade. Just some man with his camels coming down the road. You'll like this next one. This is in a, a decent-sized city, and this guy's riding his elephant right down through the middle of town. This is one of my favorites. I missed the picture that I really wanted here. That's a Brahma bull, and in India, that's a sacred animal. You don't kick it. You don't hit it. You don't whack it with a stick. Right before I took the picture, he had his nose right up against that bus and would not move. Traffic's backed up. Horns are blaring. People are yelling. He's not moving. He's got traffic just at a standstill. Right when I snapped a picture, he moved and decided to meander down the street, but he had it all stopped because you don't touch him. He's a sacred animal. I took this one just because it was funny to me. Those are live chickens. 
strapped to the back of an auto rickshaw, and they were just cackling and unhappy about being upside down. <clears throat> I'm sure they were headed to the butcher or to somebody's home to be butchered, but uh, they were unhappy chickens. This next picture is one of what the team looks like after a very busy day in India. <laughs> Actually, this is right outside one of the rooms I was staying in. I opened up my window, had wooden shutters. I opened up the shutters, had metal bars and no glass. Metal bars and wooden shutters. I opened up the shutters, looked out on the wall, and there were these monkeys out on the wall. I went and got some fruit and vegetables, and they immediately came over and started eating. Uh, they get a little aggressive when you try to feed them especially with each other, but you've got to be careful because they'll bite you if you're, if you're not careful feeding them. This is a preacher's home. He's got a huge frame, I mean a huge frame, describing the one true church. These brethren are absolutely unashamed of the truth of the gospel. They're not at all embarrassed about the nature of Christ's church, about his plan of salvation, or anything else. You look at that very long, you're going to understand a lot about the church. If you're in his house very long, I would almost guarantee you that before you leave, he's going to be talking to you about your need for Christ. These men are extremely, and women, are extremely evangelistic uh, people. Here's what we're up against. Here's the work. Denominationalism. Almost every major denomination in America has work in India. And so we have to deal with that there just as we deal with it here. These are just some of the huge denominational buildings that draw people just because of the building, not what's being taught, but just because of the building. This was new. It had not been there when I was there before in this area. This is a large denominational church. The, one of the leaders of this church was at a meeting I was conducting in someone's home. i have spoken from 1 Corinthians 1 on Paul's plea for unity. And it was a plea for baptism. It was a plea for uh, Paul's plea to the Corinthians. I'm sorry. It was a plea for unity, a plea for baptism, and a plea for the name of Christ. When I got through, he came to me and he said, I'm a leader in, one, in this denominational church. He said, would you preach for us Sunday? And I said, absolutely. What would you like me to speak about? He said, exactly what you spoke about tonight. Now you think about that. Denominational preacher or leader asking me to come to his church and talk about what he'd heard. So I agreed to do that. I showed up on Sunday morning, some 300 to 350 people in attendance. The man in the bright orange, uh, or the man in the robes, is not me. I'm standing beside him. They insisted I use their translator. They wouldn't let me use my translator. So I put my translator in the front row and said, you listen carefully. If he's not saying what I say, you let me know and we'll, we'll stop this. And we'll either fix it or we'll be done. I never, he never moved, and when it was over, he said, Brother, he, he said exactly what you said. And so I preached a simple gospel to this congregation of 350 people about the need for unity uh, in Christ and how that's accomplished. This is one of these denominational preacher seminars, 50 to 60 denominational preachers there. This one went on for two or three days with different people speaking all during the day. I was the last speaker on this occasion. And when I was through, one of the denominational preachers came up to me and said, you, will, you must never do this again. And my thought was, okay, I've made him mad. And so I said, sir, would you mind telling me why I must never do this again? He said, because it wasn't long enough. He said, you're, you're talking to us about New Testament Christianity. We, we need more than two or three days. This should go on for a week or more. You cannot have these for just two or three days. True story. I was speaking in a charismatic Pentecostal church. I spoke from Acts 8, the conversion of Simon the sorcerer. Talked about how he was converted uh, through the preaching of, of the name of Christ and the kingdom. Upon learning, he was baptized into Christ and went through the whole plan of salvation. But when I got through, I said, now let's continue to look, though, at this chapter. I said, after uh, they were baptized... Peter and John came down from Jerusalem to lay hands on them, that they might receive the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. I said, now remember, Philip was there performing miracles. Why didn't Philip just lay hands on them? Because he couldn't. 
the text says that these gifts came only through the laying on of the apostles' hands. So Peter and John had to come down. Even though Philip was a miracle worker, he couldn't pass the gift on. So Peter and John come down and lay hands on him. You remember, Simon tried to buy it. And then I raise the question, if that's true, and it is, what happens when the last apostle dies? The gifts can't be passed on anymore. When I got through, Pentecostal preacher stood up and said, we've heard a very important lesson tonight, and we need to study this carefully because based on what the Bible teaches, it appears we're claiming to have power that we really don't have. Now, that's honesty. I've spoken at numerous denominational churches from John 17 and Jesus' prayer for unity. And I stress, you know, this is what Jesus had on his mind right before going to the cross. And he prayed that we would all be one, and we're not. We don't wear the same name. We don't teach the same plan of salvation. We don't worship the same way. But Jesus prayed that we be one. And then I'll talk about how we can be one by getting back to the Bible and those kinds of things. And I can't tell you how many times denominational preachers have gotten up and said, this is, this is serious. We're not united. And Jesus wants us to be united. We need to fix this. And you know what happens when you convert a denominational preacher? Before long, you've got all of the people that he's ministering to. Sometimes they have three, four, five, ten churches. You convert one denominational preacher, it may lead to hundreds and hundreds of other people being converted. But they're honest with the word of God. Idolatry is obviously a big issue. You read in the Old Testament about idol worship on the mountain. There it is, literally, idol worship on the mountain. These next pictures just show you some of the idols. They have thousands of gods. This is their monkey god. This is Ganesh, the elephant god. This is a picture of young people paying homage to Ganesh, the elephant god. But this is the one I want to tell you about. Going into a village, my translator told the driver to stop. He said to me, he said, brother, come with me. I want you to go in this little temple with me statue there. And he said, look at that statue and tell me if it reminds you of anything. So I looked at it for a minute or two and I said, it reminds me of the Virgin Mary. He said, that's exactly what it is. I said, so Roman Catholics built this little temple? He said, no, brother, Hindus. They learned about Mary, just added her to the list of gods. You see, you have to be careful. You can't just go into a village of Hindu people and try immediately to convert them. Because you go in and you start talking about the one true God, you start talking about Jesus Christ, they are more than happy to add them to the list. Yeah, they're more than happy. So you have to lay a lot of groundwork and you have to really stress, we're not giving you another God. We're talking to you about the one and only true God. And if you're going to follow Christ, you've got to be willing to separate from all these other so-called gods. You've got to put that away. They do that, and they do it very seriously. I've had adults come to me and say, I need a new name. After they're baptized into Christ, I want a new name. And I always ask, why? Because my name is a reflection of a Hindu god. I don't want that name anymore. I want a new name. First time I heard this, a man came up to me and said, I was taught by J.C. Bailey, one of the first American missionaries in modern times to India. He said, I was taught by Brother J.C. Bailey and converted. I said, well, tell me your name. He said, and I got a new name. I said, tell me your name. I want to write your name down, take your picture so I can tell people about it. He stood up real proud, and he said, my name is Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I have no idea if he knows who Abraham Lincoln was. I don't know who gave him that name, but he was sure proud that his name was Abraham Lincoln. I said, I'm not going to write that down. I'm pretty sure I'm going to remember that. But you have to be careful. We have preacher training classes. Now, we've had to put these on hold for a while, especially uh, we have a two-year school that's not run since COVID hit because the government shut all that stuff down in India. Uh, we hope to open it up at the first of the year. But we estimate when all of our schools are running, we have a two-year school, we have a couple of six-month schools, and then we have what we call one-day-a-week schools where really knowledgeable, mature Indian preachers will take new preachers, converted denominational preachers in their area, and one day a week uh, have classes for them. 
But when this was running, we estimated that over 22,000 people a week were in one of our classes. This was a one-day class, preacher's class we had while we were there this time. About 100 showed up for that. Here's a picture of these men who came to spend all day. Each of us, again, took turns uh, speaking. When I spoke, well, that, not just me, but when we spoke, they had this whiteboard, and one of the Indian preachers would write down every scripture that uh, we cited during our lesson so that they could take notes and write all the information down. Gary, again, you'll appreciate this. I was not the first speaker. I think I was the second. So I'm sitting uh, where I'm staying, uh, waiting to go over, and going through, my, in my mind, what I want to talk about. And my phone rings. And one of the Indians said, Brother, they've got a special request as to what you speak on today. I said, oh, okay. What's that? They'd like you to cover miracles and Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> I said, how many weeks do I have? Oh, brother, you've got an hour, hour and a half. I said, okay, but I did. I touched on just the, the basics of both of those. But you have to kind of be prepared for that. You may show up to teach at a, a preacher's class for three or four days, and you may have in your mind you're going to cover this book of the Bible or these topics. And when you get there, they may say, brother, we're having trouble with this particular thing in our area, and we really need you to talk about this. And so you need to be able to shift gears and, and help them in every way you can. This is them. Uh, they were there all day, so we fed them lunch. And again, that very basic curry, rice, and chicken. The ladies like to come to these special classes, not to be trained to be preachers, but just to learn more about the Bible. Now, if you'll notice, men on one side, women on the other, that's true in any worship service in India. Men and women don't sit together. Maybe front and back and maybe side to side. The children normally sit down front, but men and women don't sit together at a worship service in India. We jokingly say this is how you take attendance, by the number of sandals that you find outside the room. Because any time you go into a place of worship in India, you take your shoes off. You go into an Indian home, you take your shoes off. Uh, you don't put your feet up on a coffee table in an Indian home. That's offensive to them because your feet are dirty in, in their thinking. And so uh, they always laugh about how many pairs of shoes are outside. For years, I wore sandals in India. I switched this, this trip for the first time because a very, very dear friend of mine who got me involved in the work in India got bit by a mosquito a couple years ago in India and died. Died in India. And so I've started wearing long sleeve shirts and socks and shoes now to kind of prevent that as much as I can. But I, would, I had a really nice, several nice pair of sandals over the years, much nicer than anybody else had, and I knew somebody was going to take mine. And so I'm speaking at a place one time, close to 500 people. When it's all over, I go back to pick up my shoes, and they're gone. And Ron was with me, and I laughed. I, did. I said, Ron, it finally happened. He said, what? I said, somebody took my shoes. And I hear this little tiny voice, no, brother. Nobody took your shoes. I've got them right here. I just took them to clean them. Yeah. I said, okay, let me get my foot out of my mouth, and then I'll see if the shoes you know, will go on my feet. Uh, but you can't imagine what an act of service that is because they're filthy. And for him to take my sandals and clean them was an unbelievable act of service. I've had them get down and wash my feet. I'd be walking in the dark, step in something, don't know what it was, don't even want to know what it was. They hear me groan, and they run and grab a bucket of water, get down and wash my feet. That's John 13, put into practice. They're that humble. That's the kind of servants these men and women are. They hold gospel meetings. A gospel meeting in, in this team, and these our brethren's mind, is not an event that goes on for several days. Anytime they teach an unbeliever, they call it a gospel meeting. It may be one-on-one. -on -one. It may be on a train. It may be in an auto rickshaw. I've seen all of this. But anytime they teach an unbeliever, they call it a gospel meeting. And here's what's so fascinating about these people. Any reason they have to get people together becomes a gospel meeting. Your child is six years old. He's having a birthday party. So you invite all the children and all their parents, and this little child has to sit and wait for an hour while they have a gospel meeting <laughs> before the birthday party starts. So he's sitting there looking at his cake and all of his presents, and I'm preaching the gospel. But that's what they do, and nobody leaves. I've spoken at birthday parties. I've spoken, I was invited to a wedding, probably 400 people there. I'm not involved. I get there. 
The preacher comes to me and says, hey, this thing's not going to start for at least 45 minutes. Why don't you preach until it's time for the wedding to start? Nobody got up, got mad and left. I preached the gospel. They, they have a big ceremony for naming their babies when they're born. But before they name the baby, they're going to have a gospel meeting. If they buy a house and they, dedicate, you know, they want people to come and share in their new house, they have a gospel meeting. Any reason that gets people together, they're going to have a gospel meeting before it's over. And nobody gets mad and nobody leaves. <clears throat> That's not the last slide, so I don't know what. Um, okay, I, I jumped way ahead. I'm sorry. I need to back up. I need, I'm going the wrong way here. Wow, I went a long way. I'm going wrong. I'm sorry, man. I'm, I, I really, okay. Um, I really messed that up. I'm sorry. We, we don't have many mass conversions. We have mass meetings. If I go into an area while I'm there to have preacher classes for, say, four or five days, I'll teach anywhere from 50 to 100 preachers all day long, and then at night we'll send almost all of them out to conduct gospel meetings. And so you'll have... Um, anywhere from 40 to 70, 80 Bible studies going on in an area every night. We average, and I, it's not about numbers, folks, but I say this just so you'll see how receptive they are. We average between two and three baptisms per meeting. That doesn't mean you have baptisms at every meeting. You have meetings where you don't have any, but you have some where you have five or six. But we average about two to three meetings, or two or three baptisms per meeting. If... Um, this is me speaking at one of these on this trip. But you start, you start multiplying that by, uh, you know, one, let me see if I can get to it. We teach over 2 million people a year. We average about three baptisms a meeting. Not mass conversions, but mass meetings. Bible studies going on all the time. This is me speaking in one of these meetings. Uh, this is a congregation of the Lord's Church. Uh, I was so impressed, having not been there in nine years, to see how the church was growing I was at one congregation that had built on twice in nine years to accommodate the people that were now attending at this particular congregation. This is one of the largest congregations among our team. It's a congregation of about 350. That's Sister Karen Clayton leaning against the post there. She was traveling with me on this occasion. I got to preach there on Sunday morning. Look down at the bottom. You'll see these men writing and taking notes. Here again, they've got notepads beside them taking notes on the lessons. Look at these girls, got their Bibles open, taking notes. These folks are simply saying, I want to become a Christian. We don't sing an invitation song. We just, when I get through uh, speaking, my translator will exhort, and then he'll say, would anybody like to become a New Testament Christian? If they do, they just raise their hand, and we get their name and start making arrangements to baptize them into Christ. A couple of quick stories. This, this man was sitting out in the street, didn't even come in. I finished speaking. I stepped outside to get a breath of fresh air and cold air, cooler air, while my translator exhorted. He's sitting in the street when they said anybody want to become a Christian. Raised his hand. He'd been listening, sitting out in the street. I rented this car and this young man to drive a car in an area where I was at. The first night, all my meetings were outside. First night, he slept in the car. Second night, he stood by the car like that. Third night, he was sitting at the back of the meeting. The fourth night, he was up front. Right after I left, I got a call saying he'd been baptized into Christ. You never know when these folks are listening to what you're saying. Uh, this is the largest meeting I've ever conducted in India. They estimated between 2,000 and 2,500 people were in this open field. We had a big PA system where we could broadcast out to where everybody could hear. Some 75 people were baptized after that meeting. They have to give us reports as to uh, who did the preaching, where it was at, were there any responses, this is one man's summary. Um, 40 meetings, 65 baptisms, no new congregations, no denomina denominational preachers converted. When we send them out at night after being with us all day in classes, we, we give them 500 rupees apiece to buy an evening meal and to pay for their transportation. 500 rupees, that's $7. $7. That covers their meal and their transportation. They have to sign for it. 
we do our very best to be accountable for every groupie that we spend in this work. Uh, this lady was baptized after my Sunday morning meeting at this big congregation outside of Hyderabad. These ladies are being baptized. Look right behind them. That's water buffalo. That's a canal, and the water buffalo are right behind them cooling off while they're being baptized into Christ. And there's your new sisters in Christ. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, I want to tell one other story, and then I'll stop. I was in a village of about... There was only about 10 or 15 people in the, in the meeting I was conducting. They'd been working with them for several weeks. I got through speaking. They asked, would anybody like to become a Christian? This man raised his hand, but with his other hand, he pulled his handkerchief out and began to cry uncontrollably. I asked my translator, go find out what the problem is. He came back and he said, brother, we've been studying with these folks for several weeks. He's ready to become a Christian. His wife died two weeks ago. Now, that's important for a couple of reasons. We've been accused of just telling, getting illiterate people to do whatever we tell them to do. Not only did he understand what he was doing, he understood the consequences of what his wife had not done. And he was broken hearted. So was I. I was two weeks late getting there. We can't save everyone, we know that. But the fields are white unto harvest. We're going to go as often as we can while the doors are still open. There's a government in place right now that's not very uh, accommodating to us. Uh, we're hoping that that won't prevent us from coming. They've actually passed laws where it's against the law in several states to convert a Hindu. It's against the law. Now, a Hindu can voluntarily decide to become a Christian. But if they believe that we have coerced them, manipulated them, tricked them in any way, we can be arrested for that because it's against the law to, quote, convert a Hindu. So we don't know how long the doors will be open. So we're going to go as often as we can and do as much work as we can. And we need your help. It's a great work. It's a big work. And the only thing that limits the good we accomplish is the working funds that we have to deal with. And so if you can help, we'd appreciate it so much. The congregation here has helped in years past, and we appreciate that and thank you for that. I'll be around after it's over to answer any questions you have. Uh, I can talk all night long about India. And so I'll stay as long as you'd like me to answer questions. Before we dismiss, though, we do want to offer to you the invitation of Christ. In Luke 19.10, Jesus said that he came to seek and save that which is lost. Jesus separated himself from all other so-called deities. Because in most religions, people are always trying to gain access to God. They're always trying to find some way to appease the gods. Only in Christ do you find deity who came seeking us. Jesus came seeking us. That's how much God wants us to be a part of his family. God just didn't just sit there and wait for us to figure out some way to get to him. God came looking for us and showed us the way to be acceptable to him. If you're not a Christian, God loves you, wants you so much to be a part of his family. If you believe that God is and that Jesus is his son... If you're prepared to repent of all past sins, confess the precious name of Christ, be buried with him in the waters of baptism, you can become a child of God this very night. If you've done that in times past, but like the prodigal son, you've kind of lost your way, come home. The father waits anxiously and is watching for you to come home, and he'll welcome you with open arms, receive you back into the family, and get you back on that right path. And I'm sure if you have any spiritual need tonight, the good brethren here will help you in any way possible. So why not come? While together we stand and sing.
evening. I uh, called Ron Clayton about two or three years ago and asked if I could use the bulletin article that he had, uh, which he was gracious enough to let me do. It was very well written, and I wanted to uh, make sure everybody saw that. But anyway, uh, it's uh, too bad about losing him for the work, but we have several more who are working over there, and we appreciate that also. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll have our closing prayer. Uh, Fred, would, would you lead us in that prayer? Let us pray. Holy and righteous, merciful Father, who art in heaven, we're so thankful that you've allowed us to be here tonight to to see the work that's happening in India and to be here, be here assembled to witness the, witness the power of your word as it goes forth and, and comes back uh, with uh, many souls that have listened. Father, we ask that you continue to watch over that work. We, we ask that you watch over us here as we strive to uh, work here in America, that we might uh, always be willing to share the gospel with all, all the people that we come in contact with. We ask, Father, that you just continue to be with the work that's there and uh, the, brother that's the, the brethren that are working there, we pray for all of them. We ask, Father, that you watch over us until we uh, assemble here again. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.